My name is Takemasa Hayashi, Showa University Northern Oklahoma Hospital Assistant Professor of Digestive Disease Center. We would like to introduce my paper reported in gastrointestinal endoscopy. The title is Management and Risk Factor of Stenosis After Endoscopic Subcausal Dissection for Colorectal Neoplasms. In esophagus and stomach, circumferential resection over 75% is the risk factor of stenosis after endoscopic submucosal dissection, ESD, and there are a lot of papers about it. In regard to colorectum, there are only two papers, two papers about stenosis after ESD, just in rectum. One mentioned that circumferential resection over 90% is the risk factor of stenosis and stenosis occurred 47.8%. On the other hand, the, the other paper reported that there is only one stenosis in six cases, circumferential rejection over 90%. Risk factor of stenosis after colorectal ESD is left open. Therefore, I want to clarify the risk factor of stenosis after ESD for colorectal neoplasms. This is the first report on stenosis after ESD for both colon and rectal regions. This retrospective study includes 822 patients with a total of 912 consecutive colorectal regions who underwent ESD from September 2003 to May 2015. The main outcome measures were incidence of stenosis and its relationship with the clinical pathological factors in surveillance. Surveillance endoscopy was performed six months after ESD. Four out of 822 patients, 0.49% developed stenosis and required unanticipated endoscopy. The other 818 patients showed no symptom or only slight abdominal discomfort that was controlled with medication and did not require any dilation or steroidal therapy. Post-ESD stenosis was limited within the cases in which the extent of the circumferential mucosal defect was over 90%. Among the 50 cases with circumferential mucosal defect over 75%, a circumferential mucosal defect over 90% is the exclusive significant risk factor. In our hospital, unscheduled colonoscopy was hardly indicated for surveillance of post-ESD stenosis. If any clinical symptom appeared but could be controlled by the medication of magnesium containing laxative and lactobacillus preparation, Follow-up colonoscopy was performed six months after ESD as scheduled. In a certain percentage of patient, patients, this period between symptom appearance and surveillance endoscopy might provide to be enough time to dilate the narrow lumen naturally with, with bowel movement and faces. 
This is the reason why incidence of stenosis is relatively low compared with previous report. Four patients with stenosis were treated successfully by endoscopic balloon dilation EBD, and steroidal therapy. Although mild residual abdominal symptoms persisted after ESD in two of the four stenosis cases, they were gradually improved without additional EBD. In addition, we have confirmed that the larger diameter colonoscope could pass through the site of the ESD during a long term surveillance of the post-ESD stenosis. Although these type of larger diameter colonoscopes had not passed just after EBD, steroidal therapy was not used for prevention of stenosis after ESD and was hardly required even after stenosis occurred. In conclusion, the results of our study demonstrated that post-ESD stenosis did not occur in cases with circumferential extent of the mucosal defect under 90%, and circumferential resection over 90% fell into a definite significant risk factor post-ESD stenosis in the colorectum. Our surveillance endoscopy policy six months after ESD would be feasible in clinical practice and could spare unnecessary unscheduled colonoscopy and treatment of stenosis because the incidence of post ESD stenosis might be influenced by the surveillance period after ESD. A shorter surveillance period would increase the detection of post ESD stenosis. Even if stenosis occurs after ESD for large collective neoplasms, it can be controlled successfully by a few sessions of EBD and steroidal medication. Thank you for watching this video. And please read and refer my paper. Bye.